We are All Soul Sisters, and welcome to our new chat series, Sisters Speak On It, where we celebrate all things, all souls, and anything that feeds our soul. Welcome, because you are a soul sister too. Hello, I am Kathy Harmon, and this is... I'm Vida. And we are also sisters, and we are here today with Joe Federini um, of The Wine Show, among many things, um, on our Sisters Speak On It. And we're really excited because we don't know a lot about wine, and so we're just going to pepper you with questions and hope for the best. <laughs> well, I'll do my best to answer them. I'm going to try, but I do slightly enter with some trepidation, particularly about this, because De well, Deborah Hartness was a wine blogger before oh, she really? started. I didn't know this. She was, and she and, and a highly, a very highly regarded wine blogger. Okay. So the books are littered with really, yes. really good wine references. They really are. And so you could ask me some really challenging questions. Like, oh, crumbs, you know, the 1811 Chateau Ecam. I do know about that one, but well, there, there are some really, really great wines. That's, that's appear yeah, in the books. you'll have to tell us that because uh, most of the ones I wrote down trying to figure out and then found out that some are no longer being made. <laughs> thousands of years old and I had no clue. I want to know about your path to this wine career that 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 you have. And it's one of those great ones because nobody ever went to a careers advisor at school who said I think what you ought to go and do is to join the wine trade except probably in my school. I, I went to um it, it, it was a very, it's it very nice school. It's a place called Stonyhurst College uh, in Lancashire. Um, now, if you've ever read uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, um, um, the, the Chuck Holmes uh, story, mm. the, the Baskerville Hall, which is this demonic, terrible mm. building, is modelled on my old school because oh, um, okay. Arthur Conan Doyle, the, the writer, was a boy there and he mm. was bullied horribly by an older boy we discovered called Moriarty who becomes the great oh, villain in all his books. Um, and at the time, there were people who sort of said, well, maybe you should join the wine trade. And um, I'd been into wine since I was about seven. And it was my grandfather who encouraged it. And I was I do remember very early memory when I was seven. He opened a bottle of Chateau Latour, 1945, which is idiotically expensive now. I mean, it's mm. I don't know, $20,000, $30,000 or something. Yeah, um, nice. I loved it. And I remember a year later being slightly sniffy about the wine at um, a cousin's wedding. It was Matthias Rosé. Although, in fairness, Jimi Hendrix drank Matthias Rosé, so uh -huh. it's not mm. a terrible wine. Um, and then it, I was going to be a soldier. That was all I ever wanted to be, mm. was a soldier. And I was determined to join the army. And a lot of people in my uh, my school went and joined, joined the army. And I was turned down twice uh, without what? prejudice <laughs> they said i was pretty much the worst candidate they'd ever Aww. seen Aww. <laughs> and i still have this devastating letter from a parachute regiment brigadier it was broadly don't ever darken our doors again you're absolutely <laughs> appalling um, <laughs> so i went off and thought what do i do next so i've got to join the wine trade so um i kind of fell into it i remember going to a lunch um, yeah, <laughs> just around then. My uncle was a wine merchant. That wasn't particularly oh, why I went in, but I was very close to my uncle, and, and he was a wine merchant. I go, well, it looks like a good business. He enjoys it. And he introduced me to all these old fellas. And at the end of this lunch, I remember, oh, I could hardly see we'd drunk so much. And they passed these tablets round the table. And I said, what's this? And he said, oh, you don't need any of those, young man, but you will. I said, what is it? He said, it's for gout. Oh. <laughs> out tablets for the next morning and uh, literally about three weeks ago i had my first attack of gout so now oh. i do have Ooh. to have the gout and tablet. that's not fun no. it's not fun at all i was no. deranged it was yeah. so painful so yeah. ladies out there also sisters don't get gout it's a terrible <laughs> terrible idea yeah I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy <laughs> So that's kind of how I fell in. I'm still because I'm still a wine merchant, and within the show, people okay. say, "Oh, you TV presenter." I'm just like, "Oh no, no, no! I'm okay. I'm a wine merchant. I just got some, I get wheeled out on telly to mm -hmm. come and talk." So I still very much see myself as a as a, as a wine merchant rather than a sort of TV expert okay. journalist. Okay. Right. So how, now that you mentioned the show, how did the how did the show come about? Oh, it's a terrible story, and it involves oh. me being it involves oh. me being completely naked. Um, oh, okay, but it's all right; it's not rude. <laughs> okay, and actually, as you find out, it's not rude at all. I was 
being a wine merchant, I'm doing a bit of writing. I wrote this column uh, and so on. And I, I sort of gave up on the idea. And right at the end, somebody said, to come to Argentina and we'll, you can make some vlogs. Remember vlogs? Mm -hmm. sort of video vlogs. And I did one. And I remember being slightly squiffy. It's an English word for drunk. <laughs> and so I'm a bit squiffy. And somebody said, would you like to have a bath of wine? Oh, it's wow. at this spa. Yeah. And I was given various options, and I'd already been massaged with grapes. And I got to tell you, you are finding those the pips in the most unusual places for some <laughs> days afterwards. So I didn't want to do that again. So I said, I just want a bath of wine. I love a bath of wine. So anyway, they run this bath. Oh, it's huge. It's in this. It's in a really high altitude mountain resort, and it was filled with Banada, it's a red grape variety. So anyway, I got in, and I remember setting up the camera and thinking, I don't know, I'll film myself. This will be funny. Yeah. So I got this camera broadcast. And uh, I was like, hello, everybody. I'm sitting in the bath of wine, having a fantastic time. This is Bernarda, and I'm drinking Malbec. And I sort of talked, I don't know, about five minutes. And on the way home, I posted this on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I, remember, I used to go in once a year to see if anybody had watched my vlog, yeah. this part of the wine. And literally about 10 people a year used to watch yeah. it. And so I kind of forgot it was there. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, the producer of the wine show is looking for a presenter. And apparently and she's, she scrolls through and she suddenly she said she's pretty much given up. She's called Melanie. She's amazing. Melanie will mm -hmm. listen to this. Hello, Melanie. Melanie's now absolute superstar. She's the genius really behind the show. Uh -huh. I say really, she is the genius behind the wine show. Uh, Mel, um, I think had sort of given up and she sees this thing saying Joe Fatterini has a bath of wine and watched it. And apparently in the office, she's like, you've got to come and see this. And there's this guy in a bath of wine, talking to the camera like this. And she found a couple of other clips, and there's one of me standing in my garden, spitting port around it. Now, I'm going to try this. Here we go. Right. And um, she sent me a message on Twitter. And, you know, within, it was less than two weeks later, I think we met a couple of days later, I always insist that I sort of, like, no, no, I'm never doing this. I, I think I said yes in... I was probably less than a light second. I think I was just like, yes, I'll do it. Um, we were we were filming within less than two weeks. We oh, went to, wow. to Burgundy and mm -hmm. um, actually Matthew de Clermont has some nice Burgundy in his cellar. He has some Bono de Matre, I know. Um, so, yeah, we went and filmed in Burgundy and I was buying, a, I bought a barrel of wine two weeks later. What are some of the funniest bloopers you've ever come across? Because I can imagine with you and just from seeing just what they leave in from Matthew, Matthew Good and James Purefoy. <laughs> I can imagine what else they cut out. Can I tell you, it got even better mm -hmm. when then James becomes Matthew's sort of fictional father in, yeah. in, 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 the, in the show. Because then the, the two of them sort of go, well, I don't look that old. Yes, you do grab that. You know, it's all that yeah. sort of carry on. Matthew and James will go, I mean, they just did their tour of Portugal just last mm -hmm. year. So they'll go around Portugal and they'll film their bits. Then, I mean, it's the most appalling planning because then what happens is we, we meet up in a place and we do anything where we have to drink together on camera oh boy. in about two days. So you get to the like lunchtime. He's like, I'm all right now, I'm serious, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and then he's got to pronounce things. And so he gets these appalling pronunciations going. And then there's lots of, he, he sort of, he, he pretends that he has a cigarette all the time. He's got this sort of thing. So he, he holds two fingers up and he goes, it's all right, love. It's all right. Now I'll do that again. No, don't worry. I'll get that. And then completely mucks it up. He does have the most wonderful life. He, he, he once had a dinner and he had quite a lot to drink. And he, you know, he sort of wanders down the next morning and he's just standing there. He says, oh dear, I appear to have rather let myself down. <laughs> And nobody can be cross about the fact that he's sort of been raucous the night before and singing and oh, yeah. he's the most charming person I think I've ever yeah, met. Yeah, uh, he seems like he is really charming, just very polished and charming. <laughs> he taught me how to be an actor. He said it's very easy being an actor. He said you go uh, sword, hanky, hanky, sword, sword, hanky, hanky, sword, and it, you've got to sort of do this flourish with your arm. So now I was just a sword, hanky, hanky, sword. That's how that. <sighs> okay, I'm going to catch my breath. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my god! And it, apparently, there's the cameraman with a spray-on sun cream trying to get it in the the dog's eyes, and the director sort of shoving at them. We do have a game. And it, it's where we sort of come up with mad stuff that's yeah. happened that people wouldn't believe. I'm the, just sitting here thinking, the truth is stranger than fiction. The truth is very much stranger. So we can be quite adventurous. We end mm -hmm. up in weird bars and places. Oh, Tbilisi in Georgia, the mm -hmm. other Georgia. Yeah. Um, we ended up in a very bizarre bar there where the wines got progressively worse as the night went on. And they were <laughs> literally undrinkable by the time yeah. we got to the end. And the sommeliers go, these are amazing wines. And we're going, there. I genuinely cannot swallow this. This is so utterly revolting. It's so they, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's absolutely terrible. It's interesting you should mention the sommelier because what's the difference between a wine expert and a sommelier? It's a very good question because you have just asked somebody who's writing a book about sommeliers. Oh. <laughs> um, about halfway through. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so sommelier comes from, it's an old French word actually, um, it comes from the bête de Somme. Mm. And it, it, it literally means a sort of beast of burden. And originally the, the bête de Somme were, were kind of horses or donkeys that would carry the king's provisions mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. as the sort of king of France would travel around France. Um, and sommelier originally was just somebody who was in in charge of carrying these sort of hefty provisions mm -hmm. which obviously included booze a lot of the time mm -hmm. lots of wine so then they, it gradually became um, a professional mm -hmm. who was in charge of um of serving wines mm -hmm. so really and there is a distinction between the united states and between the uk often okay. in the united states i'll get described as a sommelier i never would in the uk okay. i have been a sommelier so it's broadly a term that's sort of applied to somebody who works in restaurants uh -huh. whose job is not only to sort of recommend but also do service and mm -hmm. um and often slightly broader than wide you know sommeliers will often train in things like cigar service and spirits mm -hmm. um food and wine matching is is a big mm -hmm. thing um then you tend to have sort of wine experts who mm -hmm. are broader communicators that kind of thing but you, a lot of it is when you do your training and i never really then sort of did the professional training as a sommelier Mm -hmm. That is a lot of it's around decanting mm -hmm. and answering answering questions on the fly, you know, in front of somebody mm -hmm. going challenging you. Well, you mentioned two things that I wanted to ask you about. One, how do you know what to pair with what? Um, is there, there like a, a trick to it? Is there? There are two schools of thought on this. Okay. One is that the, the world of food and wine. The, is incredibly complicated and you know what you massively enhance one with the other mm -hmm. and in fact if we look back into history we often find that wine and food has sort of emerged together mm -hmm. and so i know amelia sometimes comes with a great line she says you know what grows together uh, goes together that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, so you can sometimes find that these kind of magical unions that work there's another school of thought that says no eat what you'd like and drink what you like because on the mm -hmm. whole once it all goes in you sort of mashes up the yeah. challenge if you do the second is that sometimes you find combinations that are quite frankly utterly revolting mm. and sometimes you miss out mm. on combinations that are just magically brilliant mm -hmm. the relatively um, there's sort of relatively few where something almost chemical happens that makes mm -hmm. it sort of magical there's a, a great friend of mine she's called victoria moore um she's a brilliant wine writer and she wrote a book called the wine dine dictionary and mm -hmm. half of it is foods and it tells you what wines to go. And then the other half is wines, and which foods are brilliant with them. Okay. And I go back to it all the time. I'll never okay. beat what Victoria's sort of done. Um, she's, a, she's brilliant. There's another lady called Fiona Beckett who's been a great fan of the show. And she, she's, uh, she's got a great website, I think, um, foodandwinematching.com. So there, is, there are sort of magical combinations. There are certain chemical things that happen. You know, on the whole, if you have, you know, sort of big, hefty red wines with fish, mm -hmm. it just means that the... There's so much tannin, which is looking for protein to bind onto. Okay. It sort of overwhelms the fish. It kills that delicacy. So mm -hmm. sort of white ones work nicer. Yet, then you get people saying, well, I can only have white one with fish. Not at all. Yes. Light reds, Pinot Noirs and things mm -hmm. with tuna, it's just fabulously brilliant. Mm -hmm. Monkfish is quite a red winey sort of fish. It's quite okay. meaty. Even turbot, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. turbot needs a really hefty white. Mm -hmm. uh, pork is brilliant with lots and lots of German white wines. I mm -hmm. really like pork okay. and, uh, and white wines. And then we have this mad bit in the middle because rosé now is a thing. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, and I'm a big fan of rosé. Um, and actually, it's a oh, rosé. Actually, <laughs> yeah. 
It's, Deborah Hong has once said that it was a rosé she said was the official wine of Discovery of Witches. Was it? Or, oh, or Matthew de Clermont. Yeah, yeah, it's called um, Garrus. And it's, it was, it's no longer the most expensive rosé in the world. So now people are getting quite into, well, how do you match rosés? And mm -hmm. there was an old school of thought. It sort of said you should only have pink wine with pink food, mm. which meant eating lots of prawns and lobsters. Yeah. Uh, which... Eaten mess. So um, if you have a seafood allergy, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, actually. You, uh -huh. you know, sometimes you get... Um, it's a top tip, everybody. Listen to this one. Um, you get lamb, and you can have it with a sort of Chinese allspice, and it slightly stains the outside of the lamb, it makes it a sort of mm -hmm. pinkish colour. That and rosé champagne is, quite frankly, fabulous. Mm. I'm okay. really big fan of rosé champagne and mm -hmm. food. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't drink a lot of wine, but I told you I'm from Texas, so we do a lot of drinking down here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. We just do a lot of drinking. Yeah, yeah. People in Texas do a lot of everything. I, Texas introduced me to the world of the quesadilla, which oh, I yeah. viewed as being a somewhat substantial meal that you had to have a bit of a lie down for. And the man who gave it to me described it as a snack. It's a snack. It's like, that's like between the meals. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Everything's big small. in Texas. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Big in Texas. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's interesting you mentioned decanting because I'm I'm going to pull from the list this long list of questions I, got. I love your husband it's amazing <laughs> um and he asked let me see if i can find them about um prepping bottles of mm -hmm. red versus white how do you open them and then i guess he says how do you prep them i don't know what that means I know but i'm exactly assuming what you do <laughs> so what's your husband's name i'm gonna have to give him a shout out anthony Anthony, right. That's a brilliant question. Um, there is a, one of the golden rules. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, there's two friends of mine, Peter and Susie. Um, they, Peter Richards and Susie Barry, they have a, what they call their 2020 rule. And I can't mm -hmm. beat it because it's brilliant. So red wines, you put them in the mm -hmm. fridge 20, 20 minutes before you want to drink them. White wines, take them out of the fridge 20 minutes before you want to drink them. Oh, how is that so revert? Okay. Because we tend to serve red wines too warm and white wines mm -hmm. too cold, too cold. So okay. and actually they want to be a little bit sort of closer in between i decant pretty much everything okay mm -hmm. i think everything tastes nice and that's decanted certainly if you've got white wine that is has been in barrels so if it says mm -hmm. oat or anything right. like that okay. um give that a big splash in decanter actually it doesn't even you don't even need a decanter what you can just have is a jug uh, rinse it out first. You don't want to have milk in it or anything like that. Um, you know, or a, a urine sample or something. I mean, it can be really awkward. So you you, you pour it into you you recently rinsed out urine sample. So you you pour it in and then you pour it back into the bottle, and it's called okay. double decanting. And okay. it's it effectively lets the wine kind of stretch its leg. That bit of oxygen really helps them a lot, a lot, uh, and certainly for reds. Yeah. Oh, he's gonna love this answer. Uh -huh. um, yeah, he's he's, he's gonna be common. I don't know if the job. word word connoisseur is used across the board on various things, but whatever he becomes interested in, he has to know about it to the nth degree. So, I am with him on yes. this. Right. So come on. I, another can question. I, can, I, can I ask you something about the the candor? So, I have a, a sibling. I won't call. Her name in the event she watches this video. Uh, you know, they entertain a lot, or they used to. And so, even though they weren't, she and my brother in law weren't big wine drinkers, they always had a variety of wines for people who came over. And it, I always found it so odd that if they opened a bottle of wine and people drank as much as they drank and there was some left over, they never wanted to drink it. So, my question is, how long would it last once it's opened? Because I just thought that was the most bizarre thing. Like, what? I, I don't understand. <laughs> so I thought maybe they knew something I didn't know. Because I didn't, I didn't understand that. I always keep it afterwards. The number one rule, actually, with any of this, and it's amazing, actually, how few people do this, is it doesn't matter whether it's red or white, always put it in the fridge. Hmm. It's sort right. of like, yeah. when you've opened a bottle of wine, it's kind of like milk, really. And actually, okay. it sort of lasts as long as an open bottle of milk. Okay. It's a I mean, kind of guidance my mom would and and so a lot of times when they had what they call leftover wine they would give it to her because they didn't want it had already been opened and they don't they didn't want to drink it but i i like i said i'm not a big wine person i was just curious mm -hmm. if there was anything to yeah. that 
Totally. You should meet my wife. I should bring her. She's upstairs. Um, but she <laughs> constantly gets cross because the fridge will be filled with part drunk bottles oh, of wine. Now, <clears throat> but no, I'm coming back to that later on in the week. And sometimes I, to us, that's quite interesting as well because what you find, TV really gets sort of interesting reds, actually, and whites, is they can grow and evolve. You know, it's a living thing. It's a bottle of wine. And so it will grow and change. And sometimes you drink a bottle of wine one night and then you come back to it a couple of days later and, you know, take it out of the fridge and let it warm up for a bit. Normally when I'm putting our son to bed or something, it's about the right amount of time. It's bath time, milk time, go back to bed time. Then the bottle of wine has come up to the right temperature. And then you discover it was even better a couple of days later. And there are quite a lot of wines that, you know, really will improve over, over a few days. And you know, so we sort of sit them in the fridge. Well, so, I, I, I watched one of the wine shows and you had this look of complete horror when uh, James Purefoy mentioned that he only <laughs> cooks with Madeira. And I thought, well, what about other cooking with wine? Because I've always heard that if, if it's not good enough to drink, it's not good enough to cook with. So... Yeah. So the leftovers, I mean, is that, I mean, I think it would be appropriate to use them for cooking, wouldn't it? Yeah, completely. I think lots okay. of people do. Actually, sometimes one quite useful tip is if you have an ice cube, ice cube tray, it's ah. just fill it with wine and mm. make them into ice cubes. Okay. And then you can add them later on. So ah. if you if you ever worry that you might not have some wine to add in for sauces and things later on, okay. you, you can freeze it and you can just sort of add in, you know, okay. half a dozen frozen That's ice cubes trick. of red wine and it cool. makes really delicious dishes you know quite a lot of my quite like doing sort of white wine sauces and, and things like that you know um of course as, as my husband got more and more into wine he would take me to these wine tastings and um you know apparently i'm pretty good at being able to tell i guess, what's what's the term i guess what's on the nose and what's on the palate yeah. i think yeah. okay so um apparently i'm pretty good at being able to tell but i always feel sort of stuffy when you say you know, it's like, how do you enjoy wine without sounding like a snob? <laughs> this is an utterly amazing question. Um, it's funny you should say this. One of the weird things is we tend not to put names to smells. Mm -hmm. Sort of saying, well, it smells nice or it doesn't smell very nice. But it's, it's yeah. rare that we say, you know, some things we say it smells of, but it tends to be mm -hmm. quite sort of daily things. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of those challenges is that often when we think of smells, they don't actually mm -hmm. smell of a thing. They smell often of an emotion. Your sense of smell actually sits quite close to where your sort of sense of emotional memory is. Mm -hmm. And so it is this quite emotive thing. It's also a very mm -hmm. primitive um, sense. It's, it, yeah. You know, it's, in a sense, more sort of primitive in eyesight and so on. In Scotland, there was a fascinating piece of work. It was a distillery called... Was it, um, Oh, I can remember, uh, Glen Goyne. And they did a series of tests to find out who had the most sensitive noses in their distillery. And they let everybody have a go for a bit of a laugh. Mm. Turned out that it was the cleaning ladies who had the most precise <laughs> noses <laughs> because they were having to describe smell to each other. And so they were, you know, they really mm. honed in on it. We, we sometimes come across in the show, there's this thing called the Blick, B L I C. Um, and it's a way of judging wines that we use in, in sort of wine exams. Wines are good in four ways they're very balanced, mm. B. They last a long time, great, great length uh, on your palate. So they sit there for a long time, mm -hmm. that's length. Um, they have a real intensity, which I don't mean a big, but you can taste and smell very precise things. Mm -hmm. So not very intense wines, just kind of taste of red fruit, for instance, yeah. kind of red fruity. More intense wines will taste of strawberries. You say, well, it yeah. smells of strawberries. I can, and, and you might you'll not even know that it smells of strawberries, but you'll know it smells of kind of particular fruit. fruit. Really intense wines will smell of alpine strawberries or a particular mm. sort of lemon or mm. something very, very refined. So, you know, nuttiness to hazelnut is one of the mm. great shifts that you get in Burgundy, for instance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then see, uh, really great wines are complex. They smell of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of interesting research that says that people can't name more than three things accurately in any one liquid. So when you get people who say, oh, it smells of this, and that, and the other, after about number mm. three, they're fibbing. Actually, it's much more precise in a wine term to sort of say, you know, actually, this is really beautiful. Or I think that the acidity is slightly overwhelming the fruit here, mm -hmm. that sort of balance, or it's a little bit too tannic, or it's not enough tannin in it, mm -hmm. that sort of balance. It sits on my palate for a very long time, you mm -hmm. know, and that often gives you great insight into food matching. Really good food matching mm -hmm. wines will sit for a long time in the palate because they sort of okay. melt with food. So using the Blick, B-L-I-C, okay. if you're ever just as a, a loss, just say, 
and it's beautifully balanced and it's got great length. My daughter says I don't have a very sophisticated palate when it comes to wine, so um, well, because because I pretty much stick to Rieslings. <laughs> Rosé. Now, why do you like Riesling? I like Riesling. I tend to like sweeter wines, but I like also wines that are kind of light and fresh. Okay. And Rieslings just tend to... Um, and then I didn't start liking certain rosés until I went to Paris and started tasting wines there. Um, and I won't even begin to try and pronounce uh, some of them because my daughter, who is fluent in French, would just cringe every time I tried, so... I, I just decided not to do that. But um, how do you drink your coffee, Kathy? I drink my coffee sweet and with uh, milk, with cream. Okay. Uh, can you taste uh, drinks that have got artificial sweeteners in them? Can you taste the metallic thing? Oh, I can. Sometimes, but I do yeah. sometimes use sweeteners. I don't drink it with sugar. So okay, but Vida, you can you can smell that. Yeah, it tastes yeah. that really yeah. See, I, I, it's either, a, it's an off taste to me. Yeah. Never do either not. of you put salt in your on your foods? I do. Oh, I don't. You don't. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Were you taught not to, Vida, when you were young? Well, you well, it's not that I was taught. My dad had high blood pressure, and so and you know most of our time was living in Texas. So my mother used uh, Cajun seasoning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, good. Yeah, so I don't, we don't I, and I, if I have something with salt, even if it's a little bit, I can taste it because I'm not mm -hmm. used to, mm -hmm. to really eating it. Well, I'm now going to tell you, don't worry, Kathy, you have mm -hmm. an excellent palate and you've got a considerably more precise one than me. Okay. Um, the palates fit in sort of three sorts. It's actually a okay. slightly weird kind of fourth group. Most people mm -hmm. have a roughly average number of taste buds. A lot of what you can taste, particularly mm -hmm. on your palate, is to do with how many taste buds you have. All taste buds yeah. kind of do the same thing. Um, and most people have around four, maybe 5,000 taste buds, something like that. Some people like me, and often you find this is people who are wine experts, people who know a lot about wine, often have very few taste buds because some of the sort of most expensive wines in the world are really intense and bitter and very acidic, and they're rather overwhelming. So to really appreciate those, you kind of have to have the volume turned down on your palate. So I actually have relatively few taste buds. I cannot taste the difference between Diet Coke and regular. I oh, I can. can. Really? Cannot oh, yeah. oh. Interesting. and I like coffee strong. I drank it black most of my life. I only sort of took huh. milk a bit later on. It, you know, I could really? put artificial sweetening and all sorts. Now, you both, I think, mm -hmm. tip into this sort of much more hypersensitive bar. I think mean, you've got lots mm -hmm. of taste buds um, because you can taste that difference in the sort of like coke. It really kicks in mm -hmm. because you like sweeter, mm -hmm. you know, slightly sort of milkier coffee. And I did this, I remember, with uh, she's a British comedian. I think she's. Is she on Tonight show. It's called Gina Yashiri. She's very funny. She's very rude, actually. She's, <laughs> she's filled, um, she told me the most appallingly rude jokes. And she's great fun. She's a London comedian. And um, she was there and she was like, Oh, no, I drink Sprite. I don't like anything. And anyway, we went through this and I said, No, honestly, Gina, I think you have the most amazingly sensitive palate. She's like, Yes, I've got this really sensitive palate. I think she was about to ring her mum up and sort of tell her mum that she's got this amazing palate. So we then, we were touring through California. So we, we sort of travelled and then as a comic, she made me go and do a stand up set uh, mm. in a North Hollywood comedy oh, club wow. where I died a thousand deaths, but it was great fun. <laughs> the experiences you've had. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. That's, that's why you didn't, you didn't make it in the army. That's not, that's not where you were supposed to be. Yeah. No, I think this is my sort of spiritual yeah. home, really. Yeah. It's yeah. where yeah. I'm sort of meant to be and I enjoy it very much. And, you know, even in my sort of more sensible kind of day job, I, 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 funny if I actually, as well as working on the show, so, you know, when people do it, sometimes when people have that perception that this is like a job. And so if mm -hmm. only it was, it'd be absolutely amazing if I could go and spend 300 days a year just traveling around the world drinking too much. Um, but that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. So we, and actually, we only do about 45 days every 18 months to, to sort oh. of go and make it. It's quite okay. intense when we go away. Um, we go away with about half a ton of kit um, mm. and a, a wide variety of cameramen who broadly know nothing whatsoever about wine, yeah. which creates fabulous moments. There's a brilliant bit we filmed in Canada and <laughs> this winemaker, he was a kind of winery owner, he was talking about his great inspiration in uh, and this guy and he said oh this guy in california who had inspired him to go make wine he said oh you know, he's, he's inspiration to me i you know i think this this man has changed my life and all this kind of stuff and i can see the cameraman shaking his head in disgust at this thing 
he, why is Cliff so unbelievably upset about this interview? Mm-hmm. And the guy was, he was a very wealthy sort of guy, and so he didn't want to sort of say anything, but Cliff's going, yeah. And he's, oh, ooh, it's really, really cross. Anyway, when we went away at the end, um, mm-hmm. I said to, are you all right, Cliff? And he said, oh, it was a bit of a funny interview, that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I thought that was appalling, all that stuff he said about his mentor, and that guy was like a hero to him. I think that's a terrible hero to have. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I didn't even know that Robert Mugabe made wine, let alone that he had a big vineyard in California. <laughs> Robert Mondavi. <laughs> Mugabe. And you could just see the rest of it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Am I going to have to subtitle this Robert Mondavi, California winemaker, so that people don't think this is appalling, oh vicious <laughs> leader in Zimbabwe? Oh it was now gone and got this a winery in California. So that happens with surprising frequency that we have. No, no, that's not what we mean at all. So we have a general rule that on the whole, I always look to the sound guy. We've got two mm-hmm. or three sound guys. And if they get it, we're all right. If yeah. they don't, if they look bemused at the end, we're like, no, we have to do that all again. Because oh, wow. Ted didn't get it. <laughs> My cheeks are going to be sore. I know. You are so much fun. I mean, but I have, I, I, I have to tell you, I have learned a lot. I, it, mm-hmm. It's not that I don't like wine i'm just not a big wine drinker but i was mm-hmm. telling kathy i can only i normally drink red or 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 a blush white wine a lot of times that i told her in in champagne they just they give me a headache they give me a migraine especially champagne mm-hmm. um so i've learned i've learned a lot just in this mm-hmm. short period of time from yeah. from talking to you and i appreciate that Vida, honestly, stick with the wines that you like and don't yeah. worry about feeling there's any sort of sense of obligation to drink mm-hmm. other stuff. You know what? It's it's a lot of fun. It's nice. It's sort of, and, and sometimes people come and they say, you know, you know oh, I feel terrible. I don't know about this or I don't eat such mm-hmm. and such. And you sometimes throw back and say, do you say the same things about cheese? You know, like yes. cheese. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Yeah, she does. I'm a big really, cheese eater. <laughs> you, big cheese. Cheese. you know, nobody ever goes, I feel terrible that I don't like mm-hmm. Rockfall. Yeah. Well, in fairness, you don't have yeah. to like rock for, and you certainly shouldn't mm-hmm. feel as though there's some sort of great social problem that you didn't mm-hmm. go and like. Mm-hmm. So we don't apply the same sort of class things, and, yeah, and I, I think some I of that know. does come down. You know what? You know, we look at Matthew the Clement or James Bond or all sorts of characters. Yeah. Often, being a wine collector, being a wine expert, mm-hmm. is a sort of a tick in the box of being, you know, often yeah. an English gentleman <laughs> on a sort of you know person of refined taste. Don't worry, we don't need yeah. to be refined. Yeah. It's, when I come to you and in Texas, we're just gonna drink, you know. Red. We're gonna get some, we're gonna get some margaritas. <laughs> I'm yeah. there. Now, tequila, that's yeah, that's a yeah, whole nother yeah. ball game. <laughs> we might have to push the wine till later on during the day. We're gonna have I, margaritas. Yeah, I'm too much of a lightweight for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come. Anthony and me are gonna be upstairs, that's gonna be absolutely fine. We're gonna go upstairs and like, answer his very, very long list of questions. Oh, like God, yeah, in fact, I he, I he wanted me to ask you very specific now this one i have to ask um he said there's a society of i want to say the tough devon oh yes okay so he wanted to know if that was real and if um medallions if that was still a thing so. yeah the girard well the okay. various things so you've got the chevalier de tastevin okay. and a tastevin it, oh, it, so it i comes, pronounced it right you did you pronounce it very well <laughs> if you go into burgundy cellars particularly mm-hmm. they're very common in burgundy the cellars uh, will be very dark and gloomy mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so it was sometimes hard to judge the color of the wine if you had a glass because there wasn't really a light you could hold it up against. Mm-hmm. And so what they invented was a, a silver dish that's got dimples in the bottom, it's a very shallow dimpled dish, and you could hold it and it would reflect light through it. So you could judge the color of wine even in very low light conditions. I mean, now nobody ever really uses them because they've always got lights. Mm-hmm. So what they you tend to get is these chains of office. I wish I had that. I've got I've actually got one because I've been I'm an honorary uh, sommelier from the Association of Italian Sommeliers, the um, AIS. And so I get this chain of office often in these sort of wine 
bodies, your chain mm. of bodies is usually some sort of chain, and then you get a, a Tastavan that sits there. Um, there is the Chevalier de Tastavan, the sort of knights, and they have one that's kind of over, it's got a sash that sits mm. on the sort of top of it. But it's one of loads of these sorts of organizations. And in France, mm. you get masses of them, not all to do with wine. You do get sort of cheese ones and beef mm. ones things but in burgundy uh, it, you know the, you get sort of chevalier de Saspan, then you get um, things like the girard of saint emilion and the girard of saint emilion goes back a thousand years wow. or it's maybe almost a thousand years i think it goes back to sort of king john or something like that in about the 13th century some of the really really old some are mm-hmm. sort of more modern inventions but they have something that sort of dates them right back okay. and they're sort of drinking clubs really okay um, they're by and large boozing societies but there is some <laughs> element where it's sort of to celebrate the um it, it, some do have slightly sort of almost formal duties excuse me i'm going to sneeze in a minute oh i'm not sure what that is well, um it, oh, excuse oh, me bless you uh-oh. Oh, where are we go oh. It might, it might be talking about those danky little places you were talking about. <laughs> the the is. Um, some of them will set harvest dates and things like that. So mm. they do still sometimes have these organizations. And then you get and they have these little outposts. So I know the Girard de saint Million has a sort of an outpost in Kuala Lumpur for some mm-hmm. bizarre reason. Wow. My uncle is a member of the Commanderie de Bordeaux, um, mm. which at the moment means that it's a drinking society on Zoom. Oh, and my. <laughs> <laughs> my aunt sent me a photograph the other day and he was sitting there in front of his computer with a bottle of wine and a glass oh, and he, he had he, he has a, a sort of medal mm-hmm. taste here, sort of chain of office oh, so yeah wow. wine does lend itself uh, not mm-hmm. only to chains of office but also silly hats oh, there's wow. a lot of cloaks and silly hats okay okay i know big fans well, of those yeah well now that he knows that it it's a thing or it exists i have feeling we're gonna have an <laughs> a goal somewhere in there there will be you'll want to get himself a task plan yeah okay yeah. I mean, it can be arranged you know i'll have to see if i can find some suitable you know okay. local organization to you who he can go and join oh, and then right. that's it you know, it's, it's sort of like very drunk masons but without really? the silly handshakes other than okay. the fact that people have had a drink so they can't do handshakes anymore yeah, um, really. and they have literally no secrets whatsoever so that's broadly <laughs> what these organizations are oh, so, and, and also women are very welcome so oh, it's oh, women who can't do handshakes as well oh no all the, i mean they were like all these things you know they're rather mm-hmm. sort of male back in the day but now they're yeah now they just kind of and i know in bordeaux you get mm-hmm. the most odd characters who get to sort of join them and mm-hmm. you know it's really there's, oh, it's just brilliant um, american jazz singer i can't remember her name um who joined a few years ago she's an, she might have been an opera singer i'll have to go and dig it out because it was sort of amazing and you just see her being absolutely delighted joining so yeah they've got some good fun bodies oh wow well. i mean this has just been amazing i'm it just kind of going through some of his other questions so i can say i asked them oh but, dude. um yeah but no you've actually you you covered quite a bit of it about the temperature of wines and decanting and all the rest so Look, can um, i ask can i ask something that's not on your list kathy go ahead I'm, I'm, just just very quickly i mean we, uh-oh <laughs> no, 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 no. careful no, it's, not, it's not it's not it's not it, it's just that um you know the wine show is the wine show but how do you feel uh about it relating or uh being a part of discovery of witches that a lot of times people put the two together, you know, and I've not seen that with any other type of beverage, wine show or whatever you want to say. I just thought that was kind of neat and wanted to know what what you thought about it. It's the most brilliant thing. It's absolutely magical. It was a total surprise to us. When we started, um, I remember there's a, a, a sort of particular group of Discovery Witches fans in in the UK who I think it was because Matthew was in and so mm-hmm. they, they they were sort of big fans and they you know they're really supportive an amazing gang of people um and then it just became a little bit more I think it, it also it was a, slightly it was a world that we kind of were aware of I and mean, I know Mel was a big fan anyway she'd enjoy the mm-hmm. books very much and then I kind of knew of Deborah because I knew she'd been a wine blogger and then she'd mm-hmm. gone on to this so you know I knew that she was kind of wine expert and that there was this sort of seam of wine that ran through it, but it didn't it never really kind of struck home until mm-hmm. suddenly, I think because of the Matthew connection, it started to suddenly sort of bubble up. Oh, 
oh mm-hmm. crikey yes this is it and people started to get really into it and then there's this amazing story that where um when we were filming um matthew is standing in a bar um and he gets a text message from i think it was jane tranta who's mm-hmm. producer and she said i've got these three people to be your father in the next series and he says to james you're not going to believe this and shows him this message and of course one of the three names is james <laughs> and so then there's this then they conspired together now mm-hmm. i remember right all the way through i remember the two of them going sort of, well really i mean to be honest you know he's passed it and well he's never going to it wouldn't work out at all i mean james Fielford, he's pretty good actually yeah i, I kind of see him in the role he'd be amazing and like james is literally dictating this next to him i think when they did it so then when it all came through and you know it's had the most lovely things there's been uh, greg McHugh who plays yes. yeah. Ham- hamish, hamish. Uh-huh. And I sort of knew of Greg um, before from various sort of other bits. I was a big fan of, of his work. I always enjoyed him in, in various other shows. My children were obsessed. He was on a show, um, it's called Fresh Meat, about university students. My children adored him in that. And um, so then <clears throat> he came on when we did the wine show at home and he was sort of chatting mm. us. Through. He's a really big wine fan, loves a glass of wine. Yeah. So we have a, a great fun uh, time with him. I keep in touch with, with Greg. I remember giving him sort of a wine tour. Um, so it's been really nice. There's, um, in fact, I'm doing another, I've got another sort of Zoom chatty thing with a group of Eng- uh, British, well, sort of European fans um, mm. on Friday. So oh, it's wow. all really nice. And you know what? Yeah. It's just the loveliest community of people yeah. to be part of. Yeah. So we absolutely adore it and Je- um, i know deborah you know has talked in the past about potentially finding some way of you know Combining. bringing it together because mm-hmm. oh that'd be so much fun yeah, yeah. it's a lovely yeah. combo yeah. so yeah and, and then when we did matthew and i we did our sort of lockdown when we had first lockdown we had the wine show at home which was to be honest we were just really bored and i think i watched that one yeah so yeah we were just did stuff at home and um and i managed to find three wines mm-hmm. that were in matthew clement's cellar you know, I, not the same yeah. vintage, but we could find three wines that he could then sort of try. And it was quite special, actually, to go and dig them out. And they are wines, you know, there are wines in there that you can find today. And mm-hmm. um, 1811 wow. Chateau Ecam, you won't find it. Uh, yeah. Comet vintages are always really hard to get hold of. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I probably wouldn't look, but <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's like thousands of dollars as well. So I'm kind of yeah, mad. I, I mean, it, what really makes the difference between a thousand dollar bottle of wine versus a hundred dollar bottle of wine? Not thousand dollars. It is a law of diminishing returns. Uh, you know what? The greatest wines I've ever tried have been the most expensive ones. I mean, they are mm-hmm. you know, some of the most sublime. They're kind of works of art. You don't get twenty thousand dollars worth of more wine in a twenty one thousand dollar bottle and a thousand dollar bottle. Mm-hmm. And you know, same from a hundred dollars to to a thousand. The real sweet spot sits. You know what? If I was going sort of be given a prize category to drink for the rest of my life, I'd say, yeah, $20, something like that, 2025. Mm-hmm. You can still buy a decent bottle of Chianti, mm-hmm. sort of Chianti Classico, mm-hmm. um, you know, some nice drinking. And actually, you can be quite adventurous. You can go to South Africa now, mm-hmm. which is yeah, a country really that's one. extraordinary value for money. I mean, yeah. the producers are having a tough time. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, don't get me wrong, they've had a really, really rough year because um, they've had various lockdowns. They haven't been allowed yeah. to sell domestically. Oh. Uh, the currency's been kind of weak, but the wine is fabulous. Yeah, it is. Um, and you can go to countries like Hungary, which we went to mm-hmm. in Series 3, which is making absolutely glorious wines from really old magical vineyards, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Chilean places. But, you know, I, I just bought some wine today. And, you know, I can't remember where I spent it. So was, you know, Fifteen twenty dollars, something like that. It's not, you know, mad stuff mm-hmm. uh, they were drinking. Um, and actually, I bought a box. I'm quite a big mm-hmm. fan of boxed wines. You know, just for mm-hmm. drinking every day. Yeah. If I'm just drinking every day, I'd rather go and have a box on the go, a, yeah. a really good box. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's much better for the environment. Um, mm-hmm. The biggest mm-hmm. carbon emission from the the world wine trade is moving glass around. Mm-hmm. Wow. About half of all the carbon emissions of a bottle of wine is just moving glass from A wow. to B. That's good. So boxes we we like quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that would be sort of where I would go and drink. Mm-hmm. But honestly, as a community, the two mm-hmm. sort of come together, and uh, I do get some mad questions. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm not allowed to send you photographs of Matthew Good without his shirt on. Um, they do exist. <laughs> no. but I'm in I know. I, uh, he, he seems rather private, so we, we yeah. won't. We yeah. won't, you we won't ask too for much that. into it. Don't worry. He's, he, he's an absolute <laughs> we'll just, star. You can just kind of when 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 the country the world opens back up, you can just sort of test, text us a location, and we'll just you know, have <laughs> this might show up. <laughs> One of the really nice parts about the thing is, you know, genuinely, it's just a, a bunch of friends, and we have become this. I mean, both in front and, and behind the camera, we have become this sort of bunch of, of chums. And you know, Matthew Reese now lives in, in oh, Brooklyn. Yeah. You yeah. know, he and I have become good buddies, yeah. and we we filmed in New York last uh, last I year. I saw that. Which is an absolute scream. And, you know, my brother said afterwards, and you can really tell you two get on. I said, I know the two of us just like wetting ourselves the whole time, going around and meeting new people and just sort of falling about laughing because it was just all funny. And, you know, utterly nice person. Mm -hmm. James Purefine, Mm -hmm. I chat all the time. Um, He's sort of been living mostly in in sort of Somerset. I think he's really enjoyed um, sort of working with Discovery of Witches. Mm -hmm. And he's a... He's a very sincere guy as well. You know, he's quite a serious thinker. Of all of the the various actors, he's he's a he's a sort of serious thinker. He's very involved in politics. He, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, so he works as a hospital medic, which I a hospital porter, which I never knew when he left oh, wow. school, and ah. then sort of worked his way through. Um, Dominic West, who's famed. Yeah. For the affair and, um, and the wire, that and was the wire. wire. Ooh, that was nice. Yeah, the wire was that was yeah, fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, funny enough, he went um, to meet Robert Parker, the okay. great American wine critic, because uh-huh. he lives in Baltimore. And so they sort of went up with the, the various stars they, of the show. Mm-hmm. They, they sort of went up. He said, for a man who's got the most sensitive nose in the world, he has the world's smelliest dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's just Matthew, who is an absolute scream. Uh, one thing I can reveal, because he's obsessed with golf, is yeah. that between every take, he practices his golf his swing. His golf swing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to mention Matthew, can we have you? Oh, yeah, no, of course, of course, darling. I'll come back. <laughs> Sword, hanky, hanky, oh, sword. God. I'm back in the room. <laughs> oh wow! Well, well, this has just been amazing. I don't think I've laughed this much in a long time. <laughs> My cheeks hurt. <laughs> I know. Oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's um, good. It's, you've got high cheekbones anyway, Kathy. So it's going to be getting my way. Yeah, thanks to my mom. <laughs> good, good. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is, has been very educational. It really I, has. Um, it really has. learned so much. And I feel like I can actually put my daughter to shame now because I don't drink a lot of red wines. And she says that, you know. <laughs> and because have... oh and because i like what they call fruit juice um oh yeah yeah like yeah. moscatos are very very popular here and they really are fruit, fruit juice with one, a little one bit of my... alcohol in them yeah one of my... i'm gonna give you I one can, last i'll I give you one things. last tip see if yes. you can go and find this this is actually pretty classy wine and um, it's a it's a, an unusual quite rare grape variety in italy called bracchetto it's mm-hmm. spelled b-r-a-c-h E-T-T-O, uh-huh. Bracchetto, and it comes from Acqui, um, okay. so d- Dacqui, D apostrophe, Acqui, and Bracchetto Dacqui is mm. uh, pink, and sometimes actually quite a richly dark pink kind of colour, mm-hmm. it is frothy grape juice, and it's just delicious, <laughs> and when people sort of, you know, I don't like sweet wines, they like it. Mm. you can tell real wine experts, because they go, yeah, I just adore bracchetto d'acqui, and it's wow. pudding in a glass. It's oh, wow. absolutely Ooh, magical. I wonder if so I see if you can dig out some bracchetto oh. d'acqui and just lock yourself, run a bath, shut the door, and get some candles sit, sit. going, and just have a, uh, have a sip. You'll All love right. it. Thank I have to so try much. that myself. That sounds pretty good, I even know, though I don't like it. I these. know. <laughs> we don't think you're going to like it. I think oh, you're going to okay. like it. I'm going to have to try <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you i'm going Anytime. to wait a minute oops what happened over here i was trying to turn off the, the recording but i can't seem to find the my eyes are watering from laughing so much i can't find it i can't find it <laughs>